This is Arts Review on 88.9 FM WDNA. I'm Howard Stone, and I am so glad to have you here with us. Some of you may realize that we have a special oasis just south of downtown Miami. It is known widely as Vizcaya Museum and Gardens. It is a Renaissance mansion, uh, an extensive, beautiful garden in Coconut Grove, and it is so much more. And to give us a tour of all that's offered at Vizcaya, I have invited as our guest the executive director and CEO, Joel Hoffman. Good morning, Joel. Good morning, Howard. Thanks for having me today. It's my pleasure. I know you're a busy guy. Anybody with a title of executive director and CEO has to be a, a very busy guy. Uh, tell us, please, uh, a little about yourself. What does your job entail in a typical work week? Great question. Well, you know, I've been at the Sky for over 19 years, and I would say that every week and every year has, has very much differed and, and brought great variety, uh, which I think has really helped to make this a rewarding job over a long period of time. But, uh, you know, quite consistently what we do at the Sky Howard is try to figure out how to better care for this property for the, for the buildings, for the natural landscapes, for our art collections, and really how to make them um, just sort of more accessible and um, enjoyable and engaging for our local community. That said, on a daily basis, uh, the job of this guy as executive director in many ways is like that of other executive directors of not-for-profits. Um, lots of meetings with my colleagues thinking about how we're advancing the strategic plan, um, meetings with our directors and the generous people who, who support Fiskaya, and um, definitely getting involved in a lot of administrative things associated with all of the uh, conservation and construction work that we do here. Um, so, you know, it really is a, a wide-ranging portfolio of activities, but very, 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 very varied. And I imagine that your... Uh, career and educational history has well prepared you for this job. Would you just give us a, a brief summary, Joel, of uh, who you are and uh, the, tr the track that you took to get to be the executive director and CEO of Vizcaya? Of course. So, you know, I will say there are certain parts of this job that, that no training, uh, at least no training that you would imagine uh, engaging in for this position would prepare you for, such as the day that I was told that there was a crocodile in our central fountain um, while we had visitors of, of, of many different backgrounds uh, in the immediate vicinity. But on a, on a regular basis, uh, I think my, my background has uh, served me well. I have a, a doctoral degree in art history, and I've been involved in the museum field for um, really the better part of, of 30 years. So um, I had first moved to Miami in the mid-1990s and worked at the Wilsonian in Miami Beach for five years, overseeing their public programming and a variety of other things. And um, I then returned to my native New York for three years and oversaw educational programming at the uh, Brooklyn Museum, which was an organization that was really trying to reposition itself to serve a very different community than it had served many years before. So it was with that perspective of, of really trying to figure out how to engage an ever-evolving public that I came to this position at Vizcaya in 2004. All right. Well, thank you for that. Let's talk about the property itself. Can you give us a few basic descriptions of the mansion itself, particularly the outside the location and the setting of the property. Of course. So Vizcaya consists of a total of 50 acres of property, and that spans uh, both sides of South Miami Avenue. Most everyone is uh, familiar with the Bayfront side of Vizcaya, which contains the uh, main house, James Deering's mansion, and the formal gardens. Um, and they are much less familiar with the property that uh, contains about a dozen historic buildings across the street from the main house and gardens, basically sandwiched between US-1 and South Miami Avenue. And that property is known as the Vizcaya Village. The buildings in the village and the village landscape in general were established to provide service activities for Vizcaya. 
the buildings are designed in the spirit of a of, of a baroque uh, Italian country villa. Um, so they are gorgeous structures. And um, we are in the process of restoring those buildings and really revitalizing the village as a whole to um, greatly and dramatically enhance the community offerings that we can provide here. So is the village open to the public as is the mansion and as is the grounds of the property? So right now, the village is open to the public on Sundays because since late 2020, we have been hosting with um, Urban Oasis Project, a a not-for-profit farmer's market uh, organizer, a weekly farmer's market um, in the village on Sunday mornings from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. And during those farmer's markets, we offer a variety of programmatic activities, including yoga, including uh, tours and some background of the village. We've had um, vintage car shows there. And um, in mid-April, at the April 16th Farmer's Market, we will be uh, hosting our community's amazing annual poetry festival, O Miami, for a poetry workshop um, at the Farmer's Market. So on those Sundays, uh, once a week, the village is um, very much open and available to the public, but it is our longer-term goal, and uh, the construction that's underway will uh, begin to move us towards more uh, regular open hours in which we will welcome the public. An important part about our location is that Vizcaya has a metro rail station, and directly across the street from the village is a ramp that provides access to the Metro Rail and to the Vizcaya hub on the um, underline that's currently being developed. So we're really excited about all of the new traffic and um, opportunities that we have for welcoming bicyclists and pedestrians taking advantage of that new park. Well, that's welcome news to a city that loves its cars. It's how nice it is, is to have a, a clean way of getting to Fiskaya and back home again. So that's that's fantastic. And, and I'd like to cover with you a little bit about the interior of the mansion. I understand that one of the most significant features other than the amount of rooms that are available to the public is that is that the mansion still contains largely uh, James Deering's original uh, Italian classic furniture. Uh, not every uh, historic mansion can make that same claim. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's really interesting when one kind of thinks about what this guy is the house and the and its contents are. And um, I've spoken to many Miamians, lifelong Miamians, who have assumed that Vizcaya was brought uh, stone by stone uh, from Miami. Uh, sorry, that Vizcaya was brought stone by stone from Italy. And um, in fact, really, Vizcaya was very much uh, inspired by Italy, um, as well as other European uh, cultures, France, etc., but um, in terms of the interiors, you are absolutely correct that uh, James Deering's nieces, who were responsible for conveying the property to the county in 1953, did a really amazing job of preserving the artifacts uh, original to the Vizcaya. So uh, unlike many homes of this period, uh, when you walk through Vizcaya, you really are seeing um, its original interiors. And those interiors very much do consist of a combination of much older artifacts that were imported to the United States uh, and bought by James Deering from you know various dealers and collectors, as well as things that were um, purpose built to accommodate that collection. So unlike most homes that are built, this guy was really built around the collection that Deering and his designers amassed, and um, <clears throat> again, it is it is very much intact and. I will say also one of the things that uh, you know, is kind of very interesting about Vizcaya and the period in which it was created is that uh, really American collectors at the time were very comfortable with the idea of creating what we refer to today as pastiches or kind of the mixing and matching of artifacts. So um, it was really considered very respectable practice in the day to combine um, old artifacts with some newer elements and create something completely new and and. Um, as a whole, Vizcaya really is that, something that 
brings together a lot of history, but truly exemplifies um, early 20th century American design taste. Ah, fantastic! And and uh, this little this little voice inside me ha- forces me to ask this question: in in a house with so many rooms, uh, built by somebody could, who could have added presumably any feature any features to the mansion that he desired, uh, can you tell us about any secret places within the home? Are there? Book, bookcases where you could push on the bookcase and the books move and there's a secret room behind there or anything like that? So uh, I guess James Deering had a pretty spectacularly situated bedroom and you wouldn't really be able to tell this from the way that the, the house is accessible to the public today because it had to be retrofitted to introduce climate control and allow for visitor circulation. But His bedroom, which many people observe is, you know, fairly modestly sized, has just a a glorious view of of Biscayne Bay. Adjacent to it is a balcony, um, also looking out over the bay. And the balcony uh, uh, is directly in front of his personal bathroom that had uh, both saltwater and freshwater taps. So kind of love to think of James Deering in his shaving mirror that's still on display looking out at the bay, watching boats come in and kind of enjoying uh, all the splendor that surrounded him. But his bedroom also uh, connected rather uh, mysteriously or suggestively, I guess, to an adjacent bedroom through a concealed door um, in the balcony. And it also uh, connected to a uh, room that was that he used as his office, um, a room that's very much more elaborate than most um, COVID era home offices. <laughs> and we do uh, we do have an incredible um, we do have an incredible memoir from James Deering's secretary that you know actually talks about how he moved from room to room and um, how the spaces were used and. You know, it, it, it is one of the things that we really have a bit of a challenge with, truly understanding how James Deering utilized this this home. Um, we have spectacular records of how this guy was built, but much less about how it was actually occupied. Nothing wrong with unsolved mysteries. Uh, That's true. And, and That's you, true. you mentioned James Deering. Let's talk about, just for a moment, about James Deering the man. Uh it just seems like, in in every way imaginable, the best description of him for his time, and we're talking about the the early twentieth century, was he was a he was a pioneer both in terms of industry, in terms of the way he built a home, Viscaya, that looks like it's old school on the outside, but has some modern innovations on the inside. Can you just talk to us for a moment about who was James Deering? Of course. Uh, James Deering and his family produced mechanized farm equipment uh, in the 19th century, and they were among the leading uh, producers of such equipment uh, that, you know, really played an important role in transforming uh, the Midwest and and the West and the United States and um, creating many more agricultural opportunities for this massively developing nation. And uh, uh, in the early 20th century, um, Deering's firm uh, combined with a number of other farm equipment manufacturers to create what was then the largest uh, U.S. provider of farm equipment known as International Harvester. Deering was definitely a you know very cultured guy. He had homes in uh, in Chicago, in uh, outside of Paris, in New York, as well as Miami, and um, very much a Francophile who enjoyed traveling to Europe and and entertaining. Uh, and visiting with you know people of his social class and shared interests, um, I think he was certainly unusual in his uh, work at Viscaya. He might well have chosen to build this palatial home in a much more established city like you know Newport or or Palm Beach, um, and he also elected to work with three very uh, young, fairly inexperienced but very talented designers on his project, um, not seeking to work with, let's say, the you know the biggest name of the time. I guess we also like to think of the fact that Deering was really, um, I think obsessed is an accurate word, obsessed with the natural landscape that surrounded Vizcaya. He um, 
was insistent that the that the natural forest, which is known as a Rockland hammock, be preserved while this guy was created. And you know, I think that incredible approach through the forest, the extraordinary house, unusually close to the waterfront, and uh, gardens that are you know kind of unprecedented, really, in their grandeur and scale uh, in the United States at a, at a residential site, um, really make this guy a, a pretty spectacular place. And this guy became a National Historic Landmark really because of its design uh, excellence and, and how extraordinary it is in, mm. in all of those respects. And, and I think about how bold it was uh, to build a mansion in the 1920s in South Florida, which certainly did not have Miami International Airport in existence, it, it was far away from uh, where tourists would come to visit. Uh, there was no air conditioning, and yet he decided to build his dream house on the shores of Biscayne Bay in South Florida. How, how, uh, how interesting is that? Yes, his, he did have some family here, and um, he definitely enjoyed uh, sailing and you know other activities that that could um, well be found here. Joel, I'll just take a quick moment to remind our listeners that they are listening to Arts Review on 88.9 FM WDNA. I'm Howard Stone, and this morning we're speaking with Joel Hoffman, the executive director and CEO of Viscaya here in Miami. Well, let's uh, shift gears a little bit here, Joel, for a moment, and this is really the most important part of our discussion, and that is, in, in addition to the physical presence of Viscaya, mm -hmm. Uh, you've told me off the air how Vizcaya really is an integrated part of the community in every sense, uh, in terms of outreach, educational opportunities, uh, the farmer's market, and more. Could you just talk to us about all that's going on uh, by way of community-related activities and performances these days at Vizcaya? Absolutely. So. You know, we really are very driven at this guy by uh, a number of our uh, core values. Um, those include social responsibility and relevance, equity and inclusion, really being collaborative, um, placing importance on environmental sustainability and resiliency. And those values play a tremendous role in um, helping us conceive of, of the type of programming that, that we are doing. This month, we um, hosted three programs uh, collectively known as Through the Storm. And these programs honor three women uh, really vital to South Florida, Dorothy Jenkins Field, Betty May, Tiger Jumper, and Sandra Rivers. And they are in partnership uh, with Huge Songs and Illuminarts and create a, a sort of an operatic and, and musical uh, testament or um, commemoration of, of each of these incredible women. That is just one example of the, the kind of work that we do. It's um, very collaborative and, and really um, done with an effort to be relevant to, to wide audiences. Um, another program that we do is our monthly Vizcaya Lates. Those are typically on a Wednesday evening um, from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. And we uh, take a lot of pride in really um, co-creating these programs with different community organizations. So really gone are the days that um, this guy or as a museum um, programs independently and, and tries to determine what um, is best for the community. But we are working closely with partners to create musical performances, art displays, spoken word performances. So in February, for example, we... Um, commemorated Black History Month and worked closely with the Gibson Center of Miami-Dade College. And um, then coming up in April, we're actually um, partnering uh, also with O Miami uh, at our April 26th of the Sky Elite. And um, probably many of your listeners will have heard of the um, Zip Odes competition that O oh Miami mounts every year, and we will be kind of having the grand finale of, of Zip Odes at Vizcaya on April 26th, in which um, the public will be invited to share poems inspired by the zip code in which they live. Uh, uh, another one of the programs that we've been doing regularly is called the Climate Collaborative. Um, that is something that is uh, that is something we've been doing for several years and comes. Um, very much out of our commitment to environmental sustainability and resiliency. Um, Vizcaya is 
uh, pretty much the poster child for uh, climate change. And for years, we have been asked about the impacts of sea level rise on the property. And we've been really um, hit by very, very devastating um, storms over the years, most recently Hurricane Irma. So the Climate Collaborative is a regular program that we do in partnership with um, others in the community who really have expertise um, in this content. And on May 10th, we're partnering with the Arsht Environmental Resilience Center to launch what we hope will be a fun approach to um, dealing with climate issues, an educational board game um, on the environment. Um, I'll also mention, Howard, that um, every year we um, engage in what we refer to as the Contemporary Art Program. Um, we bring an artist to the sky each year to um, create a site-specific um, installation, and we currently have a piece up in our gardens called Wish Towers by um, two Puerto Rican artists that um, deal with an environmental um, issue. Um, through the Contemporary Art Program, we um, have partnered with local academic institutions on a program called Cap Lab, which um, kind of introduces local college students to the curation of site-specific art and um, kind of most celebratory um, each year for a number of years, we have held what we refer to as our participatory public art program. And uh, this is really an amazing program. Each summer, we host about uh, 10 community art-making workshops. Um, they're really family-oriented. They're free and open to the public. And um, the artwork that is created there and facilitated with professional artists becomes... Um, the basis of a celebratory culminating event with performances. So this year's participatory public art program is on the theme of the kitchen is the heart of the home. And um, more details will be on our website soon, but the, uh, the culminating performance is on July 15th. What a, what a full slate you have. Congratulations on that. It uh, certainly sounds like your hands are full and it, it, it uh, causes me to thank you once again for carving time out of your busy schedule. Uh, you mentioned the website, Joel. Where can the public look to find out more information about tickets, about dates, about performances going forward? Yes, uh, anyone can visit our website, which is www.viscaya.org. And please remember that Viscaya is spelled with a Z, V-I-Z, C-A-Y-A dot I'm jotting that down as you speak. <laughs> Joel Hoffman, uh, Executive Director and CEO of Vizcaya Museum and Gardens, we thank you very, very much for sharing your wisdom and your insight to this uh, beautiful oasis south of downtown Miami. And uh, I hope that you'll come back and visit us once again sometime soon. Howard, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to uh, connect with your listeners. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Joel. Be well.